So we have about uh, 20, 25 minutes on this, and um, I hope it will be useful for you in the audience today. So I'm just going to talk about five things today. I want to talk about uh, what current HIV prevention services we have offered in Thailand and what we found from our experience are key adolescent needs, some case studies, so hopefully you can see what I mean by the concepts I've talked about, what challenges we found, and also how we see this going in the future. So you might wonder how it started for us, and I think a lot of you in this room may relate to how this started for you as well. So we get calls from uh, organizations near to us, and they said, oh, we have a 16-year-old teenager who's just been diagnosed with HIV. And so we get the teenager in, and he says, oh, I just started having sex a few years ago, and I, I really didn't think it was going to happen to me. And they have a concern about, am I going to be kicked out of school? Are my parents going to kick me out? And really, more or less every single week, we would go back to the office. It would be the same story over and over, so a weekly replay. And so it just got to this point where we thought, we just can't do this anymore. We need to be proactive and stop these adolescents coming to us in the first place. <laughs> so you might be wondering, okay, so what numbers are we actually talking about? So at the moment, we have almost 200 uh, youth living with HIV that are being looked after at our services. And this around five or six years ago was around near to three or 400. So the numbers of youth living with HIV are coming down. And you can see that most of them, so about three quarters are perinatally um, infected HIV adolescents and about 25% are horizontal infections. And so that cohort of our, uh, that percentage of our cohort is slowly growing. You can also see the next number down is that 257 PrEP users are now under our services, and that's started to expand over the last two years and is slowly growing as we try and roll up uh, PrEP uh, services in our clinic. And we have a large number of staff supporting these services, including doctors, nurses, public health officers, clinical psychologists, and also peer supporters, which um, if you've come to these conferences for a while, you will see that uh, they're having a larger and larger role in how we deliver services to adolescents. Um, and I think I'll talk about this again and again in this presentation, is this issue of double cascade. And so always having an option for the adolescent to choose when they come in, regardless of what the outcome is. So we're very grateful to the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center who send us most of our adolescents at risk and HIV positive adolescents. So they get around 2,000 adolescents testing for HIV um, at their center per year, aged between 15 and 24. And for those who are HIV negative but uh, report ongoing risk, we have uh, various prevention options for them, whether it's pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis. We have been uh, trialing a mobile app adherence app. Uh, we've done one with uh, support from the Cypher Grant from the International AIDS Society. Um, the findings of that we will be publishing soon uh, at the end of this year. And also um, another mobile app that we're doing with Duke University, and that study is ongoing. And also um, we have a number of couples that are serodiscordant who we also look after. And on the HIV positive side, you can see that um, we are very lucky that at the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center, they offer same-day ART, and that is also accessible for everybody, regardless of age. Um, if they're diagnosed, we provide these adolescents with peer support, and we educate them about serodiscordant couple care, about U equals U, about family planning counseling, and also we place a lot of importance on stigma, discrimination, rights advocacy, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on in this presentation. You can see that on both sides of the cascade, regardless of which side the adolescent is on, we will provide lubricants, condoms, provide them with STI screening and treatment, and uh, mental health support, which you will see um, more and more in the presentations um, in HIV conferences is uh, having more and more importance in how we deliver our services, sexual and reproductive health, and also for our transgender adolescents, gender affirming care. Um, I think this is one of the key slides. So if you take nothing back else from this presentation is, I think this is the, the key to what we do with our adolescents is that the adolescents really need tailored services. So they're not small adults. So the services we provide, we try and make them client-centered. So what are their needs? And also context-focused. So 
they may not be using condoms, but maybe they're not using condoms because there is an issue with refusal of peer pressure. Maybe they're not using condoms because they're not planning ahead. So what context is that problem occurring in? And also it's dynamic. So what we mean by that is you can have an adolescent who has great PrEP adherence in the first three months of taking PrEP, and suddenly they break up with their boyfriend. Suddenly there is a breakup in their family unit, and something changes, and everything goes downhill. So it's always important to keep the three things in mind, keeping it client-centered, context-focused, and dynamic. So this is some um, preliminary data in our Cypher funded grants that I mentioned. So we've actually submitted this to the JIS just last Friday, and this shows uh, the 200 adolescents that we followed between March 2018 and December 2019. Around three quarters were M MSM and the other quarter were transgender women. And you can see that from month zero up to month six, the retention was fairly high at 70 to 80% with youth-focused uh, adherence and retention support. I just want to talk a bit about a case that we uh, saw in the last year, and hopefully you'll learn from this some of the lessons that we got from this study as well. So he was um, an MSM who was 19 year years old, he was a student, and his risk was that he had um, inconsistent condom use, and he was the receptive anal partner, and said to us that, oh, I have a lot of different sex partners, doctor. And he came to us uh, wanting daily prep, and so that's what we prescribed to him. And later on, he said to me that, oh, um, I'm quite busy with my study, so I'm not having sex as much. And so we then decided that it was probably best for him to move to on-demand prep or event-driven prep instead. And this is what happened. So in June in 2018, he was having a lot of sex and was taking daily prep. And when his sexual activity went down, he reduced, uh, we changed to on-demand prep. And you can see in the middle of the screen, there is a tenofovir diphosphate level. And three, three months after starting prep, the level was 520, which is equivalent to taking two to three tablets per week, or a protective level of approximately 75%. In the beginning, we screened him for syphilis, for gonorrhea, and for uh, chlamydia, and that was negative. So we did this in the um, urine and the anal roots. However, halfway through the study, he developed uh, symptoms of gonorrhea and was treated. This was later microbiologically confirmed. Um, about three quarters into the study, he switched from daily prep to on-demand prep. And at that point, his measured tenofovir diphosphate level was less than 100. And so uh, this confirms that he was only taking it when he was at risk. And so he was HIV negative at the end of the six months of follow-up. However, about, about three months after this, uh, one of our staff members who's sitting in the room down there called me and said, oh, um, he's having symptoms of fever and rash. And so we, we weren't really sure if this was acute retroviral syndrome, so we called him in. And unfortunately, he did test HIV positive. So this is an example of somebody who was successfully started on PrEP, but consequently, after stopping PrEP, became HIV positive. And I really bring this case up because I think that we're very new in rolling out PrEP to adolescents, and I think that for all of us, it's an important lesson to learn, that we learned that before starting PrEP or starting on-demand PrEP, it's important to do a risk assessment about what their true level of risk is. And also, even after somebody has not, is no longer receiving PrEP from you, what is their ongoing risk level? And do you need to set up in your services some kind of interval contact to make sure that your adolescent is still okay? Do we need to be motivating adolescents to test if they have some kind of risk event? We're very grateful in this situation that we had a fairly good relationship with this adolescent, so they trusted us and they contacted us when they felt that something was going wrong. Another thing that we're doing at, in our services at uh, Chulalongkorn University is in the next year, we are planning to start trialing home testing or self-testing in adolescents to see if this will help reduce the fears that adolescents come have with coming in and all the stigma associated with getting tested at a center that's called the AIDS Red Cross Research Center. Um, and also we are trying to use more telehealth interventions and as Dr. Eileen Dunn mentioned, adolescents are always on their phone. So what can we do in that front to try and keep them engaged 
and keeping them motivated to make sure that they stay negative. But we think that we also learned from the good points in that this adolescent did stay engaged with us because we built up a good rapport and relationship with them. He did have the knowledge about what PrEP and PEP were. And because he was already uh, linked to our system, we were able to get him into care very quickly through the Thai Red Cross um, same-day ART services. And another advantage was as soon as he was started on treatment, it was the same team that was delivering his care. And so psychologically, it was less stressful for him and less of an adjustment. So what about the uptake of HIV testing? So in the literature, if you look at uh, some of the guidelines out there, um, it's very clear that there are substantial benefits for screening for HIV in high-risk adolescents from anywhere from 15 years upwards. So we're not just talking about 18 where there is the age of consent in a lot of countries. So there's benefit if they are at risk, even if they are under 18. And there was a study that was published by Pham et al. last year that talked about how higher efficacy, so the more self-motivated and uh, more initiative-driven adolescents are, the more likely they are to uptake HIV testing. And um, another team also from Myanmar did a link-up project where they did peer-led intervention packages which linked young MSM from the community to uh, sexual health and HIV services, which I think is a very good example of how we need to be thinking about linking our adolescents to get HIV testing and the services that they need as soon as possible. Um, so in December, just over a month ago, we just uh, celebrated in Thailand um, World AIDS Day as uh, we did globally, and I love this, um, this sentence that communities make the difference because I think that um, communities truly make the difference. The change, especially for HIV prevention, is not going to really happen in hospitals. It is really up to how well we can work with communities and roll out PrEP to the public. And um, a lovely phrase that was used at the 22nd International AIDS Conference in Amsterdam was, nothing for us without us. And I think that this is especially true for adolescents who we can't second guess. If we don't know, we really need to ask them what they would like for their service provision. And I want to show this with an example. And this happened around six months ago. And some people sitting in this room were in this camp as well. So. One of the activities in this adolescent camp was we were teaching them how to use condoms. And you can see in this picture we used, um, instead of a dildo, we used a cucumber. And the people in this picture are medical students. So you can see that they're struggling to, to figure out what to do. So what do I do again? And the next picture, you would think they would more advance. So these are clinical fellows, some of which are sitting down there. And these are pediatric infectious diseases doctors. And they're still figuring out, is this the right way around? I don't know. But the next thing we did was we, did, we, we let our teenagers use the condoms. And they were just like, oh yeah, piece of cake, no problem. So really, the take home message I want to give everybody is, are you addressing the actual problem? So when you're telling adolescents, you need to use condoms, is the problem because they don't know how to use condoms? Or is it something else? So this was an, a very challenging adolescent that we had in the last year. So he's 17 year old and was interested in taking PrEP. But unfortunately, when he was screened for our PrEP services, he tested positive. And this is what happened with him. Quite a long and complicated story. So he was a product of a teenage pregnancy and unfortunately suffered sexual abuse. And his parents did not protect him from this, even though they were aware that this was happening. And as he grew up, he was a young adult and he realized that he was gay, his parents were not accepting, and his friends at school were also not accepting, and he developed very low self-esteem. And to emotionally deal with this, he started using drugs and started selling sex, and eventually he was pushed to leave home. And he was always looking for love, but kept on changing his sex partners and also continued to use drugs. So by the time he came to us and was requesting PrEP and was diagnosed with HIV, his CD4 count was still quite good, but psychologically we were quite worried about him. So he was started on a standard regimen in Thailand of TDF, FTC, and efavirenz, and we feel that he had a lot of HIV stigma. Surprisingly, he was virally suppressed by six months, so he actually stuck to taking his medication. And uh, we linked him to see a psychiatrist, and he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which was also treated. 
So I think this is quite a common scenario for all of you here who may be looking after adolescents living with HIV. And as you watch this presentation, I want you to think about, well, how would you handle this? So three months later, um, I get a telephone call, and I was not in the hospital that day, and the social worker with him said, oh, doctor, um, the patient says that they're telling me to go and kill myself. So he, as I mentioned earlier, he had a history of, of amphetamine use in the last 48 hours, and so I, I asked our social worker to take him to the emergency room, and he was given 24 hours of antipsychotic care, and 24 hours, sorry, 24 hours later, this is his picture. So he was exhausted, um, not psychotic anymore, but really had no other place to go, and so was at our office. One month later, he came to our annual adolescent camp, which is from the same camp where I showed all the doctors and the medical students using the con trying to use the condoms. And he became romantically involved with another teenager who was using PrEP in our camp, and this other teenager said that he stole his money in the room that they were staying with, and he actually outed his HIV positive status online. So at the time, this was a really worrying situation for us, and it took us a long time to convince them to speak to each other and to take this, um, this kind of statement off, offline. Um, and we asked him, what are your three wishes in your life? And he said that he wanted to finish his education, to get an income, and to have a stable boyfriend. And so we then came up with an action plan that to achieve this, we were going to help him get him into volunteering work, to get him to socialize more with people who we feel would have a positive influence on him, and get him back into school. So really, the reason why I brought up this case is because as we're screening people for HIV prevention, there will inevitably be cases like this where they are high risk for HIV and they may already be HIV infected. And the sorts of problems that you will have to deal with in, or maybe are already dealing with. Um, and what we took away from this case was that Adolescents at this stage in their lives have substance abuse issues, they have mental health abuse issues, and it's really, really important to try and build their self-esteem and to try and help them to build achievable goals and to ask them directly about suicidality and mental health challenges and to try and give them as many life skills training as possible. As you heard in the plenary talk with uh, substance use, life skills are crucial in getting these people out of their old habits of behaviors and into a more positive way of living. So the next uh, case that we also learned a few lessons from was a 16-year-old MSM who was diagnosed with HIV, again at the Thai Red Cross, and he had just started having sex a year ago, had three lifetime sexual partners, and he actually had no symptoms, but his boyfriend said, oh, why don't we go to the Thai Red Cross just to get HIV testing, just to see what our health is like. And unfortunately that day he found out he was HIV positive. And he really wanted to tell his parents, but was really afraid to do so because he was worried his parents would be disappointed. So uh, I bring this up because I think for, as adolescent healthcare providers, it really is a challenge to decide, should we help this adolescent disclose to their parents or should we just go ahead with treatment without uh, parental involvement? And I think that the benefits that we have found with getting adolescents to disclose to their parents is that they get the moral support, they get the healthcare and the logistical support. And in a lot of places where they need parental consent to get access to ARVs, this helps them as well. And also it's easier psychologically for them if their communication doors are open with their parents. And also so that we can educate them and their parents regarding how to manage the stigma that it inevitably comes with uh, living with HIV. And so what we did with this adolescent was we tried to talk about what his underlying fears were and what his beliefs were. And we offered him uh, the choice of whether he wanted us to help him disclose. And also um, we offered him support on, okay, so if you make this decision, what's going to happen? If you make this, this decision, what is going to happen? And gave him the independence to make his own decision. So in this case, he chose to disclose to his parents. And we're very happy to say that the outcome was very positive. His parents were a bit confused in the beginning. But as soon as they understood what the problem was, um, they supported him fully. And he's now, uh, one year later, he's still virally suppressed and psychologically is doing very well. 
So a bit about disclosure for under 18s. Uh, there are some very good guidelines done by the New York State Department for Health Aids, and they suggest that it's important to identify an adult who can provide support to the adolescent, so it does not necessarily need to be a parent, and also document clearly what you do. And Dr. Eileen Dunn mentioned just now that it's really important regarding structural issues uh, to try and increase uptake for HIV testing as well. And I think there is a wonderful paper that was published in 2018 by Dol et al, and they talk about the things that we can do to increase linkage of adolescents to prevention services, which includes building good relationships with community partners, increasing the trust between you and your youth, and how you can uh, build capacity of the youth to navigate through the prevention services. Are you um, addressing perhaps specific issues like dizziness, like other side effects? Are your services confidential enough so that adolescents are a feel able to come in and ask you for help? Um, there is also talk in this paper about the gaps that we have in our health records, which then prevents us from tailoring services, such as what is somebody's gender orientation, and therefore what, are, what kind of support are they likely to need and what can we offer them? And also, again, Dr. Eileen Dunn mentioned that the situation is changing all the time. Are we keeping pace with how our models of care need to change to suit the situation as it exists for our adolescents at the moment. And this is just an example of what uh, happened last month. And so we're very lucky to have a collaboration with the Love Foundation. And they did a uh, screening of the, a film that some of you may know called 5B, which is a story of um, how the first HIV care wards started um, in San Francisco about 30 years ago. And we showed the, the film, and also we had an adolescent living with HIV, and people who had clinical experience living with HIV come and share their experiences and talk to the general public about this to try and deal with some of the issues uh, that we have with HIV stigma. You can see Dr. Top, who is also sitting here, has helped uh, Love Foundation with having health positive messages, knowing your status. And um, at this is a picture from the Swing Clinic uh, down um, in Bangkok, downtown Bangkok. And they have transgender influencers who produce clips, post them on YouTube, and try and give information to adolescents in a, in a user-friendly way. And um, you can see on the far right, we are very lucky that we have help from staff from the, um, the Rainbow Sky Association of Thailand to help us engage youth in uh, youth adolescent camps. And the picture in the middle, we're very, very pleased to stay at Chulongkorn University. Just a few days ago, we have set up, successfully set up a center of excellence uh, for transgender health, which includes plastic surgeons, endocrinologists, pediatric uh, psychiatrists, and infectious diseases doctors uh, working collaboratively to set up a service to provide for transgender adolescents. Um, and also the issue of trust. Adolescents really, really value this issue of trust. And every healthcare provider that works with teenagers will tell me the same thing. If they don't trust you, then you can achieve nothing with them. So it's really important for them to feel that they have confidentiality of their health issues from the workplace, from their school, from their boyfriends. And also, it's very important for us to be non-judgmental. Uh, so just the final few slides I wanted to mention now. A lot of you work in hospitals, and you'll know that it's really, really difficult to figure out where you need to go first and where you need to go last. And so what we've tried to do um, in the last few months of our services is try and get in staff and experienced peers to help them navigate through the services. Okay, you need to go to this clinic at this time, then you need to go to this doctor, you need to go to this building to have a blood test. So it's easier and less scary for them to get through the system and also provide information for them online. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we are working on a few uh, mobile health apps. Uh, this is a P3, which is one that we're working with, with Duke University and uh, University of North Carolina, adapting a um, adolescent uh, prep adherence mobile app, which uh, hopefully we will be piloting uh, towards the middle of this year. And finally, for future directions, um, we're very lucky that we have the support of Treat Asia from Annette and her team, which I think might be here. Yep, Annette's here. And um, 
So I mentioned mental health earlier, and it's increasingly being recognized that mental health is really important in looking after adolescents. And so uh, in conjunction with the Chimera D43 um, grant that uh, Treat Asia has enabled us to uh, do a study on mental health screening and management in HIV with at-risk teens uh, using PrEP in, in Thailand. And hopefully this will help to push our services to provide more screening and more care for adolescents receiving PrEP in our services. So this is up my final just take home message slide. And I think just four main points I wanted to mention today is that adolescents in prevention services do better with multidisciplinary services. So it's important to remember to use mental health services and sexual and reproductive health services in conjunction with infectious disease services to always make your services client-centered. So think about their needs, think about context, make sure that you remember that situations can change all the time and make sure that your services are delivered in a way that adolescents can trust you and always remember that they are in a stage of their lives that is transitioning and always to forgive them and give them a second chance if things don't go right for them the first time round. And I just want to say thank you for all of our working team. And I welcome any questions you have. Thank you, Dung Nanet, for your excellent work. And I think you have tell us that we need to teach our medical students and young doctors to use condoms. <laughs> and we may not need to teach our adolescents. They already know. OK, thank you. Okay, any comments, please? Uh, Natalie, that was great. Really quickly, um, I, I was curious, and this sort of came up a few days ago also, but uh, with the newly diagnosed um, individual that you described and then you're at camp and they meet another um, adolescent that's at camp, if you could share and think about some of the ethical responsibilities um, of both providing care, but also being in spaces where um, those youth might be outed, um, as well as the other youth. We often get these dynamics of um, whether or not the sexual partner knows of the status. And, and maybe you could uh, shed some light on how you're handling some of those ethical tensions. I think we had very heated discussions about this, because I, I think you can probably imagine there's no right or wrong answer. But I think that when we set up that camp, we were thinking of whether we should just have PrEP users there or adolescents living with HIV and PrEP users. And we decided with the latter because we felt that they could learn from each other. And by and large, I would say in 95% of the camp, it was a really positive experience. And this was an example of a social harm that came as a result of setting up that camp. So in terms of the ethics, I think that we can't stop adolescents making certain choices, but what we can do, and I think in hindsight, I think we, we, we could, there was room for improvement in this, was that we probably needed to talk to them more about the importance of respecting other people and keeping their status confidential and, and staying engaged with them so that they trust, our, trust the, the sorts of things that we're, we're recommending to them. Love is beautiful, and it, it can occur everywhere. <laughs> so, thank you so much, Dr. Nett.